strong passage. The real passage that kind of fits for today is 1 Corinthians 13, a very familiar passage. You guys going to move the whiteboard because it's not where it's supposed to be. Paul writes, ignore the guys in black. Um, <laughs> if I speak in the tongues of mortals and angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. And now faith and love abide these three. And the greatest of these is love. Very good. May God bless these words as we seek to apply them to our lives. I'm um, continuing our, our sermon series on Jesus is Bigger Than Christianity. And if you have uh, missed the, the earlier sermons in this series, I really encourage you to go to the church's website and catch up. Uh, watch those sermons because while each sermon is designed as a standalone, they really kind of build upon one another. Uh, and what I'm trying to say through the sermon series is that Jesus, Jesus of history, is bigger than Christianity. And Christianity has limited our knowledge of who and what Jesus is. And today, I'm really going to go after a very huge central point of what Christianity says versus what I think who the historical Jesus was and who Paul was. And this is one, one of these sermons where people sometimes fall off the edge over some of the things that I say, and it takes you a long time to pull yourself back up. And if this is one of you people, please uh, bear with me. You have all the right in the world to disagree with me. All I ask you to do is think. If you don't catch everything I'm going to say today, then go back and rewatch the video on the on the uh, on our website. Um, I'm, I mean, on our website or Facebook page. All right, because what I'm going to go after today is the whole notion: Jesus died for your sins. You know, um, a lot of people over the years have come up to me and they said, you know, I really have this difficult notion that Jesus died for my sins. I mean, that, that God somehow sent Jesus into the world to be killed so that my sins can forgive. And I mean, if God is this great big God, how come, how come God just couldn't say, take a magic wand and go, poof, your sins are forgiven, I love you, we are together in one. But yet somehow the, this notion of that Jesus was sent by God into the world as a sacrifice for your sins is kind of a litmus, litmus test. And unless you can accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and accept that he died for your sins and say those words, that somehow you're not a Christian. And I wrestle with this. Because when people ask me, do I have to accept that? I said, well, yeah, kind of if you're a first century Christian. But if you're not a first century Christian, not necessarily. So hang with me. I already see a few of you over the edge. Come on, we have 20 minutes left. It's <laughs> come back. Come back with me. See, I'm going to go back to when I was in junior high. And those of you who have been in my uh, Tuesday morning Bible study classes have, have heard me uh, tell this story before so that you just got to bear with me because the rest of the people haven't. When I was in junior high, I went to Trinity Presbyterian Church in San Diego, California. And I hope that some of you are watching this video because you are to blame. Um, <laughs> you are to blame. Grew up in Trinity Presbyterian Church in San Diego, and one time they took all of us junior hires on a weekend retreat in the Cuyamaca Mountains. And it was a great, we got on the little bus and we went up there and we played games and all kinds of things to do with junior hires. And that night, we were actually with the high school kids, that was cool, they gathered us together. We had a campfire and sang songs, it was really cool. And then I'll never forget the leader, much like this uh, picture up here, drew this chasm. And, uh, and they said that we are over here and that uh, God is over here and that there's this gulf in between us. And that down at the bottom are these flames. And we, this is H-E double toothpicks. And, um, <laughs> and they said that, you know, on our own, we cannot cross this gulf. I gotta use a different color. And that for us to, you know, that when on our own, that we just end up, no, that's going up. <laughs> we end up just going down until we are down here in hell. And that 
and that, you know, on our own, you know, you're stuck, and, and, and kids, do you want to go to hell? And I'm going, of course I don't want to go to hell. I was in sixth grade, and you told me Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And now I'm going to hell because I'm in the seventh grade? <laughs> well, some of you who have junior hires say, yes. <laughs> yes, you are. You, you just, you are, you are. And that then I, I will never forget that um, this is the 70s, of course, so black lights were the big deal, um, that they turn on a black light, and suddenly this cross appeared. And that they said, if you want to avoid going to hell, what you need to do is to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and to accept that he was a sacrifice for your sins, and then suddenly you will go here into the hands of God into heaven. And if you, as a junior higher, want to avoid hell and, and be with God forever, we're going to say a little prayer, bow your heads, and anybody who wants to go to heaven and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, raise your hand. And, you know, they did it the next night to make sure, see if they missed anybody. You know, when <laughs> I was in junior high, sex was kind of an ongoing part of my brain, kind of still is, but uh, <laughs> that, um, you know, that somehow sex was dirty. That's a whole other sermon series. Um, if you want, do you want to say Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I think when I was in seventh grade, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior about 27 times. <laughs> Because we kept on going to revivals, and they kept on saying, you want to avoid hell, and I didn't want to go to hell. Somewhere along high school, I began to think, what's wrong with this? There's something wrong with this. Then I went to college, and I really had gotten to the point where I was so sick of this, I completely pushed away from Christianity, much to my parents' chagrin. I uh, didn't want to have anything to do with it. I actually got to the point where I walked out of Sunday school when I was in the eighth grade, <laughs> walked out. In the middle of one of these things, I got up and walked out, kind of rebellion, rebel even in, 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 my, uh, in the eighth grade. My dad came out of church and said, why aren't you in Sunday school? I ain't going back. Why not? Well, because there, I said a word that I got in trouble for the next several weeks. <laughs> They're full of... Um, pushed away from Christianity. And then in high school, I mean in college, I went to Wherewith College, small Christian college up in Spokane, Washington, and uh, didn't want anything to do with Christianity. And, and then uh, one year, my girlfriend at the time, a girl I was interested in, said uh, Godspell was on uh, coming to campus. Let's go watch the movie Godspell. And I wasn't too interested, but I was interested in the girl. I said, well, let's go to the balcony. Maybe uh, the movie will get boring. <laughs> and uh, so we went up there, and, and I started watching the movie, and, well, kind of forgot about her. Because the movie gripped me. And, and there's this final scene where they, they raise Jesus up, and they sing this song, Long live God, long live God, long live God, long live God. And I remember tears and pointing, I remember pointing to the screen, and I said, that, that is what I want, that, that. That is what I want. And in that moment, my life changed. I, you know, this whole notion of the Holy Spirit, and, and it was that, it was like a turning point in my life. And, and I felt this movement and, and uh, this sense of a, of a new life, and, and I went out to try to share this new life, and, and suddenly I bumped into, so did you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior as a sacrifice for your sins? No. No, but, but that, I experienced that, I want that. 
Well, you have to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior as a sacrifice for your sins. And I immediately was back banging heads again with Christians who said I had to do something to be able to be accepted by God and experience eternal life with God. And I went, no. I went to seminary, found some of the same things. And, and then all through my entire life as a minister for the past 30 years, I constantly was banging up against Christians, good intentioned Christians, who said that I am wrong. And I know that after the sermon hits the internet, I'll be blasted with people who say I'm a heretic and I'm leaving, leading the, cur- the congregation to stray and blah, 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 blah. But I do not believe you have to say that to be loved and accepted by God. I don't even believe the historical Jesus meant that. The Apostle Paul meant it within the, circum, within the context. And what I want to show you is Paul's context. I want to show you what Paul actually really means by this. So that hopefully you will feel the freedom and the compassion that I really believe the historical Jesus wanted you to feel and what the Apostle Paul was trying to teach you. Now hopefully I have all of your undivided attention right now. And I'm going to walk with you. You're going to walk with me, actually, because I'm going to go fairly quickly. If you were here last Sunday, you know that I, le- that I left you basically at the empty tomb. And again, if you were not here last week, those are all available on the Internet. But it goes back, I'm doing this little timeline. It's like, the, here was the historical Jesus, the guy, the guy who actually lived, who then taught disciples. We have the 12. Basically, there was about 120 people who listened. Those are ears. Um, Major said that I am an artist of his liking. I appreciate that. <laughs> they, they heard and they followed and that they were with him when he bumped up against the rulers of the temple in Jerusalem who didn't like what he had to say, so they had him executed. And they put him in the empty, empty tomb. That's the tomb. And this is where I left you. And at 11 o'clock service, uh, somebody said, Don't end there! You know, and, and, and ran out of time, which might happen again today. We'll run out of time. And, but I talked about the power of God working with us in the midst of our, our darkest time. But we who know the end of the story know that it didn't end there, that something amazing happened. i got to catch up with my slides. I left you at the empty tomb. Something happened that I, that I call the great, grand, glorious something that happened. Okay, the T-G-G-S-T-H. You know that uh, scholars and, and theologians ha- have disagreed and debated about exactly what happens. It was a physical resurrection. No, it was a spiritual resurrection. And, the, and, and Christians are kind of divided all over the place on this. And, and that's why I just kind of go back, well, were you there? No. Well, then we really don't know exactly what it is that happened. That's why I call it, it's a great, grand, glorious something that happened that changed people's lives. You know, uh, Joe and I always talk about Joe says really all that we have is the faith of the disciples. You know, I like the theologian Juan Sabrino who talks about the fact that really all we know is the fact that uh, we we have the faith of we have the witness of the disciples and we have their integrity that they would not lie to us. That's all we know about the resurrection. But it was something that changed them so much so that when these disciples experienced whatever it was that happened, they could not keep the news to themselves. And eventually, uh, tradition has it in the book of Acts that they uh, were filled with the Holy Spirit and that they went out and they started telling people about the good news of Jesus and how it changed their lives. You know, we have to remember that these disciples who went out were nothing more than illiterate peasants, illiterate peasants who were changed by the message of Jesus. And it's, you know, so funny because we we, we think about the disciples as being these holy guys, you know, but they're really not. They're illiterate peasants who do nothing more than share how their lives were changed and transformed by, by Jesus who they knew and that great, grand, glorious something that happened. And then when these people, when these disciples went out, and I, I'm not really good at this. There. I hope I don't make anybody sick. There <laughs> is, is Israel, all right? When the disciples went out, some of them went over here to North Africa. Some of them went up over here into to Greece and to Turkey and over into Rome. Some of them went north 
um, up this way up into what we would call the southern Russia. And Thomas went all the way, followed the trade route up and down into India, right there on the, the western coast of India, created a, a community of the followers of Jesus. And, and these disciples, their, their message was so compelling that people, other peasants, in the beginning, other peasants, were so moved that they too wanted to be a part of this movement that they called the way. Christianity had not been developed at this point. And uh, there's a, a great biblical scholar by the name of Bart Ehrman who talks about the fact that in this early movement of these people who were followers of Jesus, you know, they did not have this concept of asking each other, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Did, do you believe that Jesus was a sacrifice for your sins? That was not their concept. Those concepts had not been developed. What they were talking about, have you been changed? Do you feel this sense of transformation? And what happened is that these illiterate peasants began talking about Jesus of history, that the Jesus that they knew who was crucified, who they experienced something, they began talking about Jesus as being the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah in history. And this was ludicrous. If you were a Jew at the time of Jesus' crucifixion and if you had heard people, peasants or otherwise, talking about Jesus as being the Messiah, you would have said that's ludicrous. Of course he wasn't. The Messiah, the messianic expectations go way before the life of Jesus, developed in this intertestamental time period, about 400 years before Jesus came, where out of, of the Jewish people, there was a sense that God would send them a Messiah who would relieve their suffering. I'm going to talk all next week about suffering. Who would relieve their suffering, that, they, that they would, the Messiah would do two things. The first of all, the Messiah would push out the Roman Empire that had come in from the north, and they were brutal, that would push the Roman Empire out, reestablish the geopolitical boundaries of the nation of Israel, and the Messiah would purify the temple because the temple had been corrupt and had come in together in cahoots with the Roman Empire. Well, Jesus did neither of those. He was killed. According to the prophecy, he was hung on a tree. He wasn't blessed, he was cursed. You know, when people come to me today and they say, how come he, the Jews didn't accept Jesus as being the Messiah? Well, it's obvious. He didn't do either one of those things. He, he wasn't the Messiah. So for these group of peasants to say that he was the Messiah, it was nuts. And so the Temple of Jerusalem, especially when this thing started developing momentum, the big mo, they said they have to be stopped. They have to be put down because they're giving out the wrong message. So the Temple in Jerusalem selected their best and brightest to go out and arrest these people, bring them back to Jerusalem, try them and execute them and put down the movement. And the best and the brightest that they sent out was this young man by the name of Paul of, 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 uh, Paul of Tarsus. Oh, that's Jesus. <laughs> that's not Paul. Oh, I missed the whole thing there. Okay, so they called, these are great slides. Messiah, I've got to catch up with them. So there is Apostle Paul. And uh, sorry. Um, and I looked all over for a great picture of the Apostle Paul. And I found this one. I, it kind of looks like Joe on a bad hair day. <laughs> and that's, that's kind of our image. He gets me back all week long, so don't worry about it. That's our image uh, of who Paul is. But Paul is more like Justin. Young, passionate, articulate. Not to say that you're not. <laughs> but you know, Justin is brilliant. You know, when he gets going on things, I kind of step back and I kind of go, whoa, baby. Especially when he starts writing things. You know, that we were talking about something, you know, among the staff and we couldn't find the right words. And Justin sat down and he started banging it out. And I read it. I said, yeah, what he said. <laughs> He's just brilliant. Well, that's kind of who Paul was. Their brightest young person. They sent out to go arrest these people and bring them back. And he was marching out and he was doing just that until he was on the road to Damascus. And if this is Israel, Damascus is up here on the northeast uh, part of the, of the um, 
of the, of the nation, something happened to him on the road to Damascus. And the book of Acts describes it, you know, that he was going out and it's like a lightning bolt pow, came down and hit Paul. And, uh, and they sell, tell it three different ways. Acts tells it three different ways. Paul, in his letters, though, never talks about the fact that he was hit by a bolt of lightning and that he was struck blind. And in fact, he talks about the fact that he met the resurrected Lord. In 1 Corinthians 13, he talks about, the, not 13, 1 Corinthians 8, I think it is, he talks about the fact that he met, that Jesus, first of all, appeared to the disciples, appealed to, Peer, appeared to Peter, appealed to the disciples, and appeared to me the least of them. It was only Acts written about 40 years later who writes about all these different stories about the life of Paul and how Paul was converted. Paul doesn't talk about that. However, Paul was changed. He experienced something with the resurrected Jesus that completely changed him. And that when you look at a timeline of, of, of all of this history and, and what's going on, the, the timeline looks something like this, that, uh, that here is Jesus in 33, uh, Paul's conversion is somewhere around 35, and the first letter that we have is uh, Thessalonians, which is somewhere around 47, 48-ish, okay? So what is that, about 13, 14 years uh, when the first letter of Paul is written. And I know that's confusing for people because we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Well, all that comes so much later, much later down in this time frame, so that we have, we have you know, the, this, this time span. Well, what happened during this time span, especially to Paul? Have you ever been working on a really hard concept, a really hard idea, and you just could not break through, you just could not understand what it was, until somebody else came into your presence, and they had worked it through, and they shared with you their, their insights, and you went, my gosh, that's it. That's it. And it opens up a whole new era for your life and your understanding. That's what the Apostle Paul was. Paul was brilliant. A lot of people say Paul was misogynist. Paul hated women. And I say you don't understand his context. Paul was brilliant. As a Pharisee, he was highly educated. His education goes back to those 400 years before Jesus. He, he could read. He could write. He had all this knowledge and understanding of the Torah. And Paul, listening to the disciples and listening to the stories of who and what Jesus is, he was able to make these fantastic connections that shared with these disciples who are the way, the effect that Jesus had upon their life and the effect that Jesus had upon his life. And I really kind of boil it down to there's two things that Paul found. First of all, what Paul discovered in Jesus is the sense of freedom because as peasants, they were not free. You know, within the 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 Jewish society at the time, if you were a peasant, you were constantly in a state of pollution, constantly in a state of being unclean. And the only way that you could become clean would be that you had to go to the temple and you had to constantly sacrifice for your sins. You had to offer a, a bull, a sheep, a dove, cereal offerings, whatever you could afford, to, and then you would be forgiven. And, you, and, the, and the presence of God was right there kind of in the middle of the temple, and that was as close as you could get to the presence of God. And, but then as soon as you left, you were unclean again, and you had to go back and, and you had to sacrifice. And so if you were present, you were constantly caught in this never-ending cycle. And it was Paul who wrote in, in the book of Galatians, no, 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 you are free. Paul began to look at Jesus as being the perfect sacrifice for our sins, that God's action through, through Jesus was, was that you had been set free from this crazy notion of constantly having to purify yourself. And so the whole letter of Galatians is about, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. The other thing that Paul realized was God's compassion through Jesus. That God so loved the world. God so loved the world. And Paul wrote in Romans 8 that nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, 
then I'm a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. And that somehow, somehow, for Paul, the action of God through Jesus was to set you free and to show you about love. And for these first century peasants, hearing that Jesus was a sacrifice for their sins and that they were suddenly free and they got to experience God's love directly, then this whole notion of being the Messiah took on a whole new understanding. Well, then yesterday I ruined my Saturday because I, I sat down to make sure what I was going to say is true, and I think it is. Because I, I wanted to see what the church did with Paul's notion of liberty and freedom. And I got to the Apostles' Creed and Nicene Creed. Then I saw what happened in the development of the early church, then got to the Reformation. First of all, I went to Augustine and then to Aquinas. Aquinas, I got to the Reformation and I read, you know, Luther and Calvin and Zwingli. And, and then I read the Scots Confession, the Heidelberg Confession, and the Second Heidelberg Confession, the development of the Anglican Church and all the bloodshed and crazy things that happened in the Anglican Church. And then from the Anglican Church, I went to following Protestantism, not so much Catholicism, but Protestantism across into the New World. And then I read the Westminster Cate Catechism, the Shorter Catechism, the Longer Catechism. And then I read about how denominations broke into 33,000 different denominations around the world. And suddenly this notion of liberty and freedom went, hey, Do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and as a sacrifice for your sins? And all I want to say is give me the man. Now, I know that some people, this question of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior as a sacrifice for your sin works. I have this picture of, of Will Smith in the movie Seven Pounds. Do you remember in the movie, Will Smith is a character who caused a terrible wreck and he kills seven people. And he feels as though that he has to give part of his life, part of his body to make seven people live. He has to turn things around. And I remember hearing the movie, when I was in the middle of the movie, watching the movie, I said, dude, you really need to hear about Jesus as a sacrifice for your sins. Because I don't care how much flesh you give, you cannot atone on your own for what you have done. You need to hear that Christ has done that for you. And for some people, their guilt is so profound that this message of Christ dying for your sins is the only way we know how to release them from their burden. However, if this is not you, and you cannot say that, or it doesn't ring true for you, I want to say, I want you to hear the message of the man. Liberty. Compassion. What do you need to be set free from? What has been weighing you down? Where do you feel guilt and grief? Well, you need to hear Jesus talk about that you are free. Do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Think what you want to think. Explore what you want to explore. Do not be chained by anything or anybody. God gave you a brain, use it. God gave you a soul, use it. God gave you a heart, use it, use it, use it. You are free. Then you need to hear about compassion. your feeling is that you have done something that has somehow separated yourself from God or separated yourself from each other, then you need to hear, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am nothing, I 
gain nothing. Faith, hope, and love. These three abide. But the greatest of these is love. And that's what the man tried to say. That's what Paul tried to say.